<clears throat> How are you doing, Ernest? Hi, I'm doing good yourself. Okay, hanging in there. <laughs> it's week four. Hi, Beethoven. How are you? Hi, Samantha. Okay, so check out Canvas. We're going to start the first part of week uh, chapter eight today. So, um, we'll wait a few minutes for everybody to join. I hope you're doing okay, Beethoven. Let me share the screen. We'll start in about three minutes. Let me get my notes open and so you can check out the notes, download it, and then also check out the assignment. So we're going to go into counting and combinatorics this week and next week. We only have about five people for now. So you can find your notes in the module. Okay, that's there. And yeah, you can also find the assignments there too. It's part of unit four. So we'll start in a minute, okay? <clears throat> okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. I think people will pop in um, at six o'clock. I don't want to keep everybody waiting. So this is the module for this week. Everything is going to be due at the end. I know we have a little bit more this week, 
Uh, normally we only have one assignment in the lab, but we are gonna get ready for our quiz. So make sure that you check this out. This is your quiz um, review. I know it says the 18th, but basically it covers all the chapters that we have gone through since the beginning. Okay, and then you are, once you complete the quiz review assignment, you can submit that at the end of the week. So all the questions on it, we should have gone over already. So it should be very familiar to you. There is an extra credit quiz game, it's on quizzes. Um, I close this assignment at the end of the week because I do give out the price for this. Um, so if you have the highest score, you will get an Amazon gift card for $25. Um, so that will be delivered via email. So if you want to do the extra credit, you can play the quiz review game. It's supposed to prepare you for the quiz. And then when you finish, you can take a picture of your score and then you can just upload that. And um, whether you have the highest score or not, you will still get the extra credit with the highest score. I'll send out a gift card, okay? And then after you do the quiz review game, you should take the quiz one, which covers chapter one, two, three, and seven, which we've gone over in the last three weeks, okay? And then chapter eight, nine, 10 is gonna be on the next quiz. <clears throat> So that way um, we will also review for that at the end. In your quiz, you have three attempts. The highest score will be recorded. So if you take the quiz, if you're happy you're with your first attempt, that's fine. But if you want to go again a couple of times, it will allow you to do that. Okay, so don't forget to do the quiz, the quiz review. And if you want the extra credit, you can attempt the extra credit this week. I will have other extra credit uh, opportunity, not just quiz games, but we will have other opportunity you see. Okay, <clears throat> so for now, we are gonna cover chapter eight notes. And what I did was I broke chapter eight into two parts. We are gonna do part one this week, and then we are gonna do part two next week. Okay, so that chapter eight is broken into two parts. <clears throat> Sorry. So um, this week we are gonna talk about combinatorics. And um, if you have taken statistics class or other classes, um, sometimes you have gone over some areas in combinatorics. This is important for us because when you start programming, you might, come across a problem that you need to solve and you need to understand how to use combination and permutation. So combinatorics is a way that we look at math regarding counting, looking at objects. So your object could be in an array, it could be in a vector, it could be in a container, in that we would be able to look at how it would enumerate and be able to pair or group up um, a certain set of values to represent a combination or a group of numbers to output something or to give us the result. So many of the problems that we see in com computer science um, and that would relate to real life that would use counting. And we're gonna look at some of the examples starting with a restaurant. So as you go to a fast food restaurant, or if you go to a sit down restaurant, sometime you would see these combination of meals. Like at McDonald's, you can do a combo four and that will be a hamburger with drinks and fries. And then you can have other combinations or sometime you can pick and choose. Um, for example, if you go to Chili's and they would say, pick, you know, an entree and a type of dessert or and an appetizer out of the list. And so how does these businesses determine 
what would be the appropriate combination for the cost that they are using to produce your meals. So from a business aspect, you, you know, they have to really calculate out, you know, a salad plus an entree plus a drink would be equal to this. So they would still make a profit. Then we would look at how we would use these objects. And from a programming perspective, you can have all of these items in an array as part of your menu. And then as the user select options, right, it would select the values out of, of your array and be able to present that to the user and then calculate the cost with the tax for the meal. So in the example here, what we see is that Alice is ordering soup and sandwich. There are six types of soups and 12 types of sandwiches. So when Alice needs to choose either one of the six soup or one of the 12 sandwiches, she would be, then be presented with six plus 12 or 18 different meals. So she can, she can choose something like a pea soup with um, a turkey sandwich or a, another type of sandwich with another type of soup. So when you're presented with a group of choices and you have to make one choice, you would use what's called a sum rule. So here it tells you that the sum rule is applicable when one must make one choice from the union of two sets of alternative. In our example, we have two sets. We have one set that will be soup and another set is sandwiches. So when we have to make a choice between a soup or a sandwich, then that becomes a sum rule. So how do we know how many, how many different meals can the user choose? Well, there are six types of soup. We're gonna take that and we're gonna add it with 12 types of sandwiches. That will give us 18 meals. So you would do the addition when you're presented with one choice out of the multiple groups, okay? So that becomes a union of your sets. So you would take the cardinality of the first set, which is six, plus the cardinality of the second set, which is 12. So that gives you 18 in this situation, okay? So that will be the sum rule. Now, in the second example, example B, Bob is going to order both soup and sandwich. And Bob is presented with the same choices as Alice. But in his case, he's going to pick both, one from each group. So six types of soup, 12 types of sandwiches. And Bob can choose one soup and one sandwich. So in this case, we would then multiply. We would use the product rule. So he would have six ways to choose the soup and 12 ways to choose the sandwich. So we would take six multiplied by 12, which gives us, which gives Bob 72, diff 72 different types of meal that he can order, right? So, when you transition from the first case to the second case, you can see that in the second case, we would then multiply in that we would choose, we would have multiple choices in multiple groups, okay? Now, if we throw a drink in there, let's say that we have eight types of drinks, then we would take six times 12 times eight, which gives Bob 576 possible meal choices, okay? So in this case, Bob can pick a sandwich, a soup, and a drink. Then that will be 576 possible meal that he can pick from. So you would see that then it become a larger set of options for the user. <clears throat> so
So now um, in your assignment, in the first question, it asks you, when is the sum rule applicable? And you can pull that from the notes. You can state that the sum rule is applicable when one must make one choice from the union of two or more sets of alternatives. Okay, so when we make one choice from multiple sets, from the union of the sets, then we would do a sum rule. We would add. And in the product rule, we know that we need to multiply. <clears throat> so now let's try to do number two. At the movie theater, there are popcorn, candy, pretzel, nacho, and five types of soft drink. You decide to select an item, that means an item of snacks, and a type of soft drink for the movie. Remember, now in the questions, it tells you that you have how many choices? Two, right? You get a snack and a drink. Okay. Oops. Then it asks you how many choice, how many combinations will you have? So in this case, we would do a product rule. We would take four types of snacks because we have popcorn, candy, pretzel, and nacho. That's four. We would multiply it by five types of soft drinks. So five times four is going to give you 20 different combination in the snack choices that you would have, snack and drink, actually. Okay? Because it simply is that we are combining, right? The two groups were union. We have a union of the two sets. So, and we are making multiple selections from those sets. So that in that case, you would multiply. Now let's say that you have to make a decision between the food or the drink. Either you eat or you drink, right? Then how many choices would you have? Then in that case, you would do a sum rule. You would have four types of snack plus five types of soft drink, which give you nine choices. So that becomes a less of an option, okay? So then you can narrow down to the nine choices. Any question? Now let's look at the scenario C. If you decided to select two different food items and a soft drink, how many choices do you have? And let's assume that once you select a type of snack, you cannot pick the same one again. So I cannot have two popcorns, right? I can only do one popcorn and a nacho or a popcorn and a pretzel and so on, okay? Then in this case, what we're gonna do is we are gonna take the four types of snack that we start out with, which is on the menu. Then once we pick one, we are gonna reduce it down to three because there's three left, right? So if I pick popcorn, then I only have candy, pretzel, and nacho for my second choice. So I would have three types of snack left. Then I can pick a drink, which is five types. So I would take four times three times five, which gives me 60 different options in how I would pick two snacks and a drink. Okay. And you see this a lot in, you know, in different options for the user when they make a purchase, right? Like a package deal, where you pick an option here and an option there and then another option from the third group, right? So from this point, you can see, okay, so how many choices are you gonna be able to, to, to have? And you're gonna pick you know, one, one combo from that. And this is what we know as combinatorics. So in the case C, it's different than the, the B, the 2B in that once we select the snack, we don't select the same type again. It has to be different. 
right? And you see this restaurant, they use this all the time where you pick an entree and a salad and then, you know, you can do a salad or an appetizer and so on, right? And then you cannot have the same type of entree. You can only pick one type of entree. So now for three, we conclude that the product rule is applicable when one must make two or more consecutive choices from the sets of alternatives. So in the case where you would make more than one choices, right? We already know that it's a product rule. And then in some cases, we cannot have the same option in that group, like in our, our movie theater scenario C here, where we can only pick the snack once. And then the second time it has to be a different snack. We're still gonna use the product rule, but we just have to reduce, right? The option that we already select, we have to remove that from the set of options. Any question? So I'll put that so you can see one, two, and three. And you don't have to type it exactly like I do. Um, I type it out like that so you can see the specific. And it's just a good way to keep notes for you. Okay. And you can find example and the information again in the textbook and our notes. Oh, Professor Wen, um, really quick, just for C, um, I'm not understanding why we would start with the four types of snacks. Why, why not just start with just picking three? initially yeah so the option we have here is popcorn candy pretzel and natural right that's what we have to we're presented so we're going to have to pick from the pool here okay then once i i select let's say i selected natural that's out so i'm left with three if you start with three you're not using the maximum number of options in the in the group in your set. Your set okay. start with four, right? I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maximum. So if 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 this was to say, let's say if you have to pick three different food items now, then you're gonna do four times three times two times five, right? So let's say that I buy a movie uh, VIP package where they can say I can pick three snacks from the menu and my menu has four items right? But I cannot buy the same snacks because they might run out, right? So I would have four times three times two, and then I can pick a drink, which is five. Okay. Thank you. Got it. You're welcome. Okay, good. Yeah. So you want to, pre you want to start with the cardinality of that set, and then you would reduce by one as you go, right? And we're going to look at, you know, lock combinations and all of that good stuff. Any other questions? Good questions. Okay. So are we good with this? One, two, and three. Okay. All right, so here's another example. And this has to do with pin numbers, right? We use pin number for ATM. We use pin number to log into our phone and our computer. Um, pin number is used quite a bit, okay? And yeah, you can generate random pins. We'll talk about randomization down the line. But let's say that you have an office lock and it requires four digit pin. So you, you would want to see how many pins is possible, okay? And I like to look at this from the user perspective. And I also like to look at it from the perspective of somebody that's trying to break that lock, right? So how many tries are they gonna get before they get the right number? Okay, 
I deal with cybersecurity. I teach cybersecurity classes, right? Enumeration is very common uh, for brute force. So this is a way that we look at that. Like, how do they write that script, right? And if you took my 30A class, um, they were also, they get to do a project. They, an option of the project was to do keylogger, right? Like how to record an input and then take that input and use it elsewhere. Because you have to know how it works in order to protect, all right? How it's broken in order to fix it. So here is a set of digits. We know that our numbers are gonna be zero through nine. Okay, because pin numbers uses decimal. So you can have, this is your set, zero through nine. And your cardinality is gonna be 10 because there are 10 numbers if you count them up. So remember that we have four digit pins. So we have four choices from the set. So that means that we have digit times digit times digit times digit. Keep in mind that we can reuse the number, right? That means I can have all zeros or all ones or all twos or all threes and so on. Because normal pin number, you can reuse the number. I can have zero, one, 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 right? So in this case, we would do cardinality, which is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, which is 10 to the fourth. So that means that there's 10,000 different pins combinations. Okay. Now, if you present to the user that no, you cannot use that number again, right? Like if I choose zero, then in that case, I would do a 10 times nine times eight times seven, you see? Because you have to remove that number from your set. But in this case, we can reuse the same number. So our four digit pins, we would then have a total of 10,000 different pins to choose from. So in order to break that law, right, I have to have at least 10,000 try to get one successful because out of those, one's going to be successful. Okay. And for somebody that you create a software to do that, it depends on how fast you can enumerate through it, depending on the operation, the functions that you write. So if somebody is trying to break that combo, they just have to try at least 10,000 to get a successful one. And sometimes it's sooner. And we'll talk about search and sort later, right? Like how it would look through and it would find, but okay. So as you can see, that will be 10,000 different pins. But if we have seven digits, that will be 10 to the seven. That will be 10 million. So why do they make you do longer password? Because for brute force, it's enumerating characters. And the longer the characters, the longer that's gonna take to break it. And in cybersecurity, we buy time, right? If the attacker, usually if they have enough resources like processor, RAM, time, and you know manpower, usually just like you know development and so on, to write the script, then they'll be able to break it, right? It's a matter of time. So you just buying time there. So in a 10 digit or uh, seven digit pin, you see drastically huge jump, okay? So that's why they say strong password has more characters because it enumerates to each of the character, okay? All right, so let's take a look at another one here. It says a single pin has to be either four, five, or six, or six or seven digits. We use the product rule to separate the count of the sets, four digits, five digits, six digits, and seven digits. Then we would sum it up to see the union. So if we're looking at you know, pins that have at least four, five, six, seven digits, we would look at each of the pin as it's counted 
for the digits. And then we total them up, which gives us this, about 11 million. Okay. So when they say that you can create a password between eight to 12 characters, right? And you want to find out how many possible passwords that people can create out of those. So you have to take a look at what's the, the using the product rule for the eight character, the nine character, the 10, 11, 12 characters, and then add them all up. Questions? Okay, so let's look at another one and then we'll do the exercise. So if we're doing alphanumeric password, meaning that we're gonna use uh, letters and digits, okay, characters and numbers, and we are gonna do upper and lower case. So we would look at first your set of characters and English alphabet has 26 uppercase character and that's different than the lowercase. So we also have 26 lowercase letters. And then we have the 10 digits, zero through nine. Okay. So together you have to total them up to look at your set because this is now your set. 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase and 10 digits, not just individual, right? because we can pick from that particular set to make our password. So our set is, our set cardinality is 62 because we can, we can choose from all of these. Then once we have the cardinality, then we're now gonna look at the characters for each. So if we're doing a four character, then we're gonna take 62 times 62 times 62 times 62, which gives us 62 to the fourth power. That gives you 14, about a little bit more than 14 and a half million. And that's only four character. So if you're doing eight character password, that's larger, right? So you would do 62 times 62 times 62 times 62. So it's we 62 to the eighth, and that will be the size for the eight character. Okay. Now, if you are trying to break the password, right, for a really slow system, that will be one per second. How long does it take to break a four digit pass password that's numeric only? So earlier we solved this, we know that it's 10 to the fourth that gives you 10,000 possible password. And if it enumerates through, and if it's using just a linear, right? That means it's gonna look for each and it's gonna try each one of them. So that will be about 10,000 seconds, at least. If you convert that to hours and minutes, that will be two hours and 46 minutes and 40, 46 minutes and 40 seconds, okay? Now on the current system, you know that it doesn't take one per second, right? We're on microseconds. If you're looking at the newer processor, so it's faster, okay? Now, if we're doing case sensitive and it's alphanumeric, we solve this from A, we know that there are 14 million passwords that could be alphanumeric upper lower case. So assuming that it's one per password, one second per password, then that's going to take about 171 days. Okay. So here to show you, right, why they make you do longer passwords, <laughs> or you should use passphrase. <laughs> so there you go. Mathematically proven. Any question? All right. So let's go into the next one. To open a combination padlock, remember those? I don't know. It, 
when I was younger, I used to have to take PE in school, right? Some of you did too. And you have those round lock, you go left, you go right, and there's a certain number of numbers, right? So think about those, have a padlock or the padlock that you rotate to get your combination. Okay, so let's say that you have a padlock and you have, you can use three numbers between zero through 40. How many combinations can you use? So first we have to understand our set, zero to 40. That's 41 numbers. So your cardinality is 41. And let's say that we can reuse the number, right? We can use like number 333. Three, three. Then you just take the 41 and you raise it to the third which gives you 68,921 possible combination for that padlock. But if we don't reuse the, the numbers, we would start with 41 times 40 times 39, which gives us less, 63,960. And you can check with your your scientific calculator, right? So if we don't reuse the digit, we see that it would be a less total number of combinations that we can create for that padlock with three numbers. Why did I raise it to the three? Because there are three numbers, okay? Like I can have 0, 10, 40 for my padlock. Or I can have 40, 40, 40, right? If I reuse the number. Any questions? Okay, so number five is similar to what you have in the notes. It says an attacker is using brute force software to guess your password, which is seven characters and it's case sensitive alphanumeric, upper lowercase and numbers. So we didn't count symbols into this, right? Because our current requirement for passwords, usually they want to you, you to use at least one symbol we're only looking at um, letters and numbers. So how many different passwords must a software attempt to get one correct? Okay, so we would have 26 uppercase letters, 26 lowercase letters, and then 10 digits. So your total set is 62. You add everything up here, which gives you 62 or cardinality, okay. So your setup character size is 62. Then since it's seven characters password, then you take 62 and you raise it to the power of seven, which gives you this, okay. And you know, if you want to do the calculator, right, there's scientific mode. You just go here to scientific, right? And I can punch in 62, raise it to, right, the seventh power. And I would have this. You can take this, you write, you can select all, and then you can copy, and then you paste it into your answer. There you go. Okay, so we answer question A. Let me move this down so you can see them together. Because it's 
separated it. Question B, it says, if you decided to use symbol, right? And let's say that they allow 16 symbol, it really depends on, right? How they, what kind of symbol they allow. Some symbols um, for most website, right? They would use like, you can use, you can use exclamation point, you can use um, certain symbol like dollar sign. There are certain symbol that is used in SQL to query. So to prevent SQL injection, they eliminate some of the symbol there. You know, so if you're looking at like, you know, the encoding um, list, there are a lot more symbols than, than what we normally see. But so it really depends on the administrator. Okay, so 16 allowed symbol for your password added with your characters and digits. So now we have to change our cardinality. We would take 26 plus 26 plus 10 plus 16. We got to add the symbol in there, which gives us our set size is 78. And if it's eight character password, then we would take 78, raise it to the eighth power, which gives us this total number of combinations for the passwords, okay? So if you look between this and this, right, much higher. Okay. So now, once we have that, we want to determine how long is it going to take them to brute force this many passwords, right? Try everything to get one correct. That's the worst case scenario, by the way, right? So sometimes they go halfway through and they would get it correct so it's faster, okay? So you would have this many attempts and for each attempt, it would be half of a second. So we would take 0.5 second multiplied by the attempts which gives us this many seconds. And if we want to convert it to hours, days, and years, okay. So worst case scenario on a slow system, right? That will be the time to attempt all of those password combinations with upper lowercase numbers and 16 symbol. Now, we didn't consider the factor that the password could be a dictionary password, so they can use a list of reference. For, so for the software, it, it would refer to that list and then um, if it's already exists in the list, it's simply plug that in and it's a lot quicker, okay? So you often see, this is just side note for those of you who are interested in cybersecurity, um, brute force with rainbow attack where they would use, you know, and lists can be created in all different languages. So if, if you think that you can be clever and make it into like French, right? There are lists in French, in Spanish, in Chinese, everything. Then for question D, it says, suppose the password may have eight case sensitive alphanumeric characters and must contain at least one digit and at least one letter how many are there? Okay, so we know that our cardinality for the password without the symbol, right, upper low case and all, and, and the digits that will be 62. Since it's eight character, we would do 62 to the eight with no restrictions, right? That's the start. 62 to the eight is without any restrictions. But now when we imply restrictions, 
we have to really think about how that would be changing with the sets, okay? And this is when you see inclusion and exclusion principle. We would include everything and then we would subtract, we would exclude what we would represent as restrictions. So of the 62 to the eight passwords combination, there are 52 to the eight that are letters, right? How do I get 52? It's 26 plus 26, upper and lower case. And there will be 10 that will be digits, right? Zero through nine. So 10 to the eight, that will be digits only. So that means that if, you know, this is the total number of combination that will be just only digit passwords. And then the total combinations of only letters passwords, that will be eight characters. So we have to find these values then it says that all the others have at least one digit and at least one letter. So you would take the total with everything, subtract letters only and digits only, then you would have passwords that have at least one letter and one number, okay? So we include everything and we exclude the, the restrictions. <clears throat> Any question? Okay, no questions. <clears throat> so after some example, it also shows you on how the bit strings would be, right? There's eight bits in a byte and two to the eight because it's binary. There are two numbers, zero, one. So two to the eight gives you 256. For the 16 bits, you would take two to the 16 gives you that. And then um, when you're looking at the largest integer that can represent in 16 bit and 16 bit sometime is a word size um, that would be for the traditional like Intel x86 systems and even Microsoft uses word size 16, uh, 16 bit. So when you look at that, um, only the positive integer, then you would represent it with 15 places. So it's two to the 15, you need to subtract one because that one bit in the front is used to hold positive or negative sign. We talked about this in the first week which gives you this, okay? All right, so let's talk about people selection now. So let's say that there are three classes. Each class, one class contains 73 students, second class contains 64 students, and the third class contains 41 students. And now what we need to do is we need to choose one student from all the groups, all three classes to make the notes for the final. <clears throat> Where in this case, when we're choosing one out of the consecutive group of choices, then we are gonna have to do the sum rule. 73 plus 64 plus 41 gives you 
178 possibility to pick one student from all the three classes. Then you would look at the case B. When we want to choose one student from each class to participate in a committee, because we're picking one from each class, then you have multiple consecutive choices from the alternative of the group, then you would then apply the product rule. 73 plus 64, I mean, times 64 times 41, which gives you 191,552, right? Ways to pick one student from each class. Then now, what if we want to select six students from a certain class, okay? And that class is the, the, the third class. We wanna pick six students from the third class. And we are not allowing the student to be reselected. Usually when you select people, they're out of the group, right? Once you, when you pick them, you cannot put them back in the group and select them again, right? That's not the case. So we would say that there are 41 students to start. And then, so we would take 41, then you pick a student out of that group, then you reduce that to one, you would multiply it by 40. Take one more out, multiply it by 39. Take one more out, 38. Take one more out, 37. Take one more out, 36. We stop here because we already have six people. So then you have this many, okay? Ways to pick six students from the third class. And this is an example of what's called permutation, where your, your selection cannot be repeated and there's order. So you cannot put that person back in a group and select them again. Once they're selected, they're out, you have to remove them from your, your set, right? Now, if you need to, to pick six students to form a volleyball team, right? From all the three classes, so we would then have 178 total students in all three classes. When we pick six people from all three classes, we would then again do a product rule. So 78, 178 times 177 times 176 times 175 times 174 times 173, and that gives us six. So then it would appear that your choice of six people would then look like a six factorial, six times five times four times three times two times one, right? From that set. And we will look at the, the choice, the choice um, formula later, okay? So another example here on passwords, And we've done this one in the assignment. So for the last question, you can also refer to example 8.5. And this is a good example to present inclusion exclusion principle. So in the inclusion exclusion principle, it would then be used when a single choice must be made from the sets of alternatives in which it would be disjointed. where you have mutually disjointed options that they don't share the common elements. So when you're looking at the password, the characters doesn't share the common elements with the digits, okay? But you impose 
the selection from those alternative sets. So you have to take a look at them as a total and you have to exclude because they don't mutually share elements. Okay. So this is an example from the book um, talking about Alice and Bob at the deli, right? So what if you want to create strings with a certain letter to start, right? Like A or N with a Z, then you know that you have 26 letters in the alphabet. And for six uppercase letters start, why don't we raise it to the sixth power here is because we omit one of the letter, we exclude that. So it's 26 to the fifth power. Okay. And same thing with the Z, 26 to the fifth power that would end with the Z. So we would take 26 to the fifth, that will be for the A, plus 26 to the fifth, that would start with, would end with the Z. And we want to subtract, right, every other. So that will be 26 to the fourth, what's left. Because we only care about the A and the Z. So we have to remove what's not A and Z, which is 26 to the fourth. Okay, any question? All right, so let's do number six together. There are three groups of audience, 30 people in group one, 40 people in group two, and 50 people in group three. How many distinct ways can a person be selected from three groups to win a prize? One person selecting from all three groups. So you're making one choice, right? One selection out of the three groups of alternatives. So you add them up. You use the sum rule. 30 plus 4 plus 50 gives you 120. For 6B, how many distinct ways can a person be selected from each group to meet the performer? So now we are selecting one person per group. So then you have three consecutive choices from three groups of choice alternatives. So that will be 30 times 40 times 50, which gives you 60,000 ways to select one person per group. For question C, how many distinct ways can five people be selected from group three to win tickets for the next event? So we would start with 50 because group three has 50 people. Then we take one person out, then we multiply it by 49. Take one person out, we would have multiply it by 48. Take one person out, multiply it by 47. Take one person out, we multiply it by 46. We stop here because we have five, right? And so here is the number of distinct ways 
that we can pick five people from group three to win tickets. So professor, would this be an example of the permutation? Because yes. you can't pick them anymore? Okay. Right, and B too, B is also another oh. Okay. So now when you start thinking about lottery tickets, contests that you enter, right? What's the possibility of winning, right? You can calculate that. <laughs> Okay, then D, how many distinct ways can we select five people from all groups to win backstage passes? So we would total up our set from all three groups. We have 30 plus 40 plus 50, which we already found here, 120, right? So when we pick five people from all groups, because it's five consecutive choices from the groups of alternative, we would do 120 times 119 times 118 times 117 times 116. That gives us five people. And that will be the outcome, the value for the number of distinct ways to select five people from all three groups. And when you look at the lab this week, you will find that <clears throat> developers already write libraries for you to permutate through a, a group of data in array or vector, right? There are already functions that were written in STL that would do this. Okay, so we can compute and look at the combinations on how it would generate, you know, let's say that you, you wanna write a, a program that's gonna generate variations of passwords or pin number or, <clears throat> or you know, combinations for padlock, for example, then there are already functions that we can use depending on how you want it to permutate, okay? So we'll talk about that this week. So it's a little bit more advanced than last week where we, again, are gonna use STL, but we are gonna look at how the function works and how you would go about writing those type of programs using those functions. Okay, any questions with these? So expect that we will have these type of questions on the next quiz, similar to this, where you will be given, you know, case scenario where you have to compute um, the distinct ways of selecting people, of finding the total number of passwords or pin numbers and so on, similar to what you've seen in the assignment. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about, let's do one with in inclusion exclusion principle. And Discrete structure is about looking at the specific logic and utilizing mathematical theorem to solve a problem, right? Um, you do see some of this for university or a job interview where you're given a problem to solve and you have to program it. So you really have to take a look at 
you know, how to really solve it logically and then put that into programming language. And I hope that I can deliver that in this class. <clears throat> so seven, use inclusion exclusion principle to determine how many positive integers between 100 to 987 are inclusive. Okay. So we would have 900, we would start with 100 to 987. So we would start, first start with finding the cardinality, right? Like what's the set size? So we know that it has 888. And we want to also see how many of these integers that are going to be divisible by eight. So we know that between in this range, every, every eight digit is divisible by eight. So you would take the cardinality, which is 888, and you divide it by eight which gives you 111 positive integers that are divisible by eight. So it asks you how many integers are divisible by nine, then you just take it divided by nine, right? And then it asks you how many positive integers between 100 to 987 that are even. So every other is an even number, so it's by two. So you divide it by two. That will give you 444 even numbers. So my question for you is how many positive integers between 100 to 987 that are odd? Do you know anyone? Okay, you can give me the answer by the end of the session. All right, so for C, how many positive integers between 100 to 987 that would have distinct digits? That means that they do not repeat, like one, two, three, five, six, seven, one, one, two, they cannot have like one, one, two, three, 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 four. So the, the digits cannot be repeating. So in this case, right, we would look at the specific. There are three digits because 100 has three digits, 987 has three digits. We see that here. They all have three digits. The leftmost digit cannot be zero because we start at 100, that's obvious. So there are nine choices, okay? The second digit can be any digit but the first because we don't repeat, right? So if the first is one, you cannot have the second digit as one. So there are also nine choices because you can have zero, right? No one, but two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's nine. And since we already have the first two digits for the third digit, we're left with eight choices because we removed the other two. So we're left with eight because originally we start with 10. So there will be eight choices for the third digit. So then you would apply the product rule. You would take nine times nine times eight, which gives you the answer for C. 81 times eight. Any question with number seven? There's also a similar example in the textbook and the note for this?
Okay. So I won't go over eight yet. I wanted to continue with the notes. Do you have any question for me for seven? So example eight, seven is a good example to look at if you wanted to solve similar to what we just did, but in this one, it has four digits, right? And we can use inclusive exclusive there. Divisible by nine, you just find a cardinality divided by nine. The even, you would divide it by two for the distinction. The only difference is that they're here we're dealing with four digits in the, our assignment is three digits, okay? And then it even goes further and it talks about how not divisible by three. So what you do is you take the cardinality and you divide it by three and you subtract it to get that the, the number that will not be divisible by three. So you exclude it, okay? And then also it shows you how it would be divisible by five or seven. So this is a good example to look at. So for the five or seven, this is also inclusion exclusion. First you find divisible by five, then you find the divisible by seven. Then um, also certain numbers. So it goes on and shows you how you can calculate those. Okay. Any question? So take a look at the example, go through it, calculate it so you know how to do it. All right. So let's talk about pigeonhole principle. So the story goes that this particular principle comes about with pigeons, where let's say that there are 12 pigeons, right? Each would require a hole. So if you, if you release the pigeon and if they need to find a hole to stay in, right? You have to have at least 12 hole for each pigeon to be able to stay in one per hole. Now, the pigeonhole principle state that if k plus one or more objects is placed in a k box, there must be exist a box that contains two or more objects. So if I have 13 pigeons and I only have 12 holes, there would be one hole that would have two pigeons and that's what the principle state, right? Logically, if you release the pigeon in an area, you have 12 holes and there are 13 pigeons and you, you, the pigeon is trained to go into a hole. So that means that two, there's one hole that would have two pigeons. So if there are 13 people in a room, it's guaranteed that at least two of them have the same birth month because there are 12 months in a year, okay? Based on the pigeonhole. So if you have, let's say if you have 33 people in the room, right? There will be, there will be a very high chance, actually, there will be at least two or more people that would have the same 
day of birth. I'm not talking about birthday, exact month and so on, but day of birth, like the first or the second in the actual room. Because if you're looking at the total number of days in a year, the maximum number of days is 31 days, right? Then if we have more than that number of days, there will be likely that you would have two or more people that would have the same day of birth. The same concept as birth month. So let's take a look at the next question. If there are 38 people in the room, how many people would be guaranteed to have the same day of birth? So we would say that the maximum days in a month for the long month, that would be 31 days. So we would conclude that there would be two or more people because 38 is higher than 31, right? So you would have at least two or more that would have the same day of the month for birthday. Based on pigeonhole principle. Any question? All right. So before we answer the next one, let's switch over. So I wanted to use the example 810 actually, because we don't post stuff with social security number anymore. Okay, so in a drawer, there are 12 red socks and there are 12 blue socks, right? And we need to pick out the socks. So how many attempt for us to pick a pair right, that is matching. So I need to have either two blue or two red, okay? So I have, based on pigeonhole, I have to attempt three times to get at least two matching color socks because there are two colors, right? Because I need to have at least two blue or two red. So I need to go three times at least. Then how many times we want to make sure that we get a pair of red socks? Well, if we look, there are 12 red socks and we want a pair. So we have to go 14 times, right? So because we can pick all 12 blue and then the next two will be red. So worst case scenario is that going to be 12 blue, and then two red, okay. Then on the next one, we want to pick at least one color each. So we know that there are 12 of each color. So I can have 12 all red socks and I need one of each, right? So I need to go one more to get a blue, so 13. Okay. Then in the next example here, it actually shows you the proof. Every integer n has a multi multiple that is zero and ones in its decimal expansion as we do the conversion. So for the proof, it says that consider n plus one numbers. We can have one or one one or one 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 one, and the last number will be n plus one. So when we evaluate it, we simply just take a modulo or a mod of n, and we would do some modulo, uh, a modular arithmetic later. So if then a minus b is divisible by n, then we would take the numbers of the same value 
subtract it. So in this example, let's say that n is six. If you take one mod six, you get a one. 11 mod six, you get a five. 111 mod six, you get a three, right? 1,111 mod six, you get a one. So when we take 111, subtract one, you get 1,110, 1, that would be multiple of six. And here is the equation that would be represent your pigeonhole principle. And also another example here. So suppose that there are 52 students in the class. How many students is guaranteed to have the same birthday or the same month of date of birth, right? So we know we would take 12 months and there are 50, 51 students. So we would take that divided by 12. So you would have five students that's guaranteed to have the same month for birth and at least five okay so so make sure that we understand pigeonhole principle and and how to solve problem that use pigeonhole principle like what we see with the example in our assignment Okay. And then lastly, we would define permutation. So earlier we solved some problem that has permutation. Permutation is defined as an ordered arrangement of set or a subset of objects. Okay. So the example that the author uses is that she runs Aaron, right? like going to the grocery store, dry cleaner, uh, hardware store and post office. When you run errand, you don't repeat the errands at the same time. So once you complete that errand, you remove it from the list. And when we look at permutation, we also have associated costs, right? Realistically, when we solve this kind of problem, we would say, well, Cost could be time, cost could be, you know, the distance that you drive. So earlier I mentioned that in the brute force, like a brute force software, it would go through all the permutations to really pick one that would be successful. So there is associated cost with that. So when we look at computational system, we would say the associated cost with that would be time, right? System resources like RAM processor, power eventually would contribute to running that system and so on. So if we're looking at time, then we would say, how long is that gonna take to run the first errand the third errand, the fourth errand, or the combination of how the sequence that would be in order. Okay. So when you're looking at decision-making system, let's say that it would tell you which errands to run first, then it has to really weigh in the cost, right? Like uh, the, the driving distance for your errands or the time to accomplish that errand. So do I, do I do the first, the fourth, the second, and the third, or the third, the second, the fourth, or the first, you know? So we can take a look at how it would then be able to make that decision to accomplish that task. And that is using counting count, which is what we see with permutations. 
okay? And the equation would look like this. So you would have n factorial is n times n minus one times n minus two times n minus three and so on and so on. So we will work more with using the equations with for to calculate your P using the R permutations. So this example here, and I'm gonna finish it up with this example because we're gonna pick it up right here um, in the next part, talking about permutation and then solving some of the, the problem. So at the wedding party, there's a bride, the groom, the parents, right? The bride's mother and father and the bride and the groom's mother and father, best man, maid of honor, ushers and bridesmaids. How many ways can we arrange them in a row for a picture? So there are 12 people. So that means that we can have 12 factorial ways to arrange them in a row. So you take 12 times 11 times 10 times, because once you arrange a person on the left, right, you don't rearrange them on the right. So you would reduce that to, by one and by one and by one again, all the way to one. So it's 12 factorial. Then how many ways if the bride and groom stand together on the left side of the line? So then you would have 10 factorial because now you remove the bride and the groom because you already put them on the left side. So we can do bride groom on the left, Right groom on the right, right? Right on the right, groom on the left, and so vice versa. So you would take the 10 factorial, then you would multiply it by two because there's two ways that you can arrange that, either the bride on the left or the groom on the, on the left. And then we would do um, the bride and the groom are together but anywhere in the line. So we still would have 10 factorial. Then we would have the 11 position because now we're adding either the bride or the groom anywhere. And then we will multiply it by two because there, there, there is a bride and a groom. And then another case that if we can have five members of the people to line up for the picture, then just like what we've done before, we would do 12 times 11 times 10 times nine times eight, which is really equal to 12 factorial divided by 12 minus five factorial. 12 is the number of people. And then we would take the difference after we, so we exclude the five, and put that into factorial and divide. So that will be the same as this. Okay, so we'll work with the equation more next time by looking at cases something like this and how to solve it for next week. Okay, so you can also look at the other example um, so to answer the last question or the last few, right? Permutation is an order arrangement of set or a subset of objects. And when we apply this, right, we use it for something that's non-repeating or we cannot reuse that object.
Any question? We still have a little bit more to go. So we're going to do the movies question next. So we should change this to like red box or some kind of rental movie, but Netflix is fine, I guess. You just may pay for the subscription with Netflix, but if you do something that you can get free movies. Okay, so 10, it says you get to, re you receive 10 movies, five comedies, two action and three drama movies. And you want to watch three comedy movies of the five free options. How many possible arrangement of comedy movies can you watch, right? So here we will permutate because most people don't watch it twice, right? And so we just assume that we are not gonna rewatch the movie. So we would start with five, that's the comedy movies that we were given watch a movie, reduce down to four. So we multiply it by four, watch another movie. Then we would reduce that down by three, multiply it by three, which gives you 60 possible ways to watch your movies in a certain order. I can watch movie A, B, C, or C, A, B, or B, A, C, okay, and so on. Out of the five. Sorry about the highlight, I'm a visual person, so I like color to, <laughs> on my notes, okay. Um, on your day off, you decided to watch four of the comedy movies, two of the action movies, and three of the drama movies. How many possible variation of movies can you watch, right? So you would start with the comedy, which is five. So you would do four of the comedy. So five times four times three times two. Then because it's consecutive choices, multiple consecutive choices. So you apply the multiplication instead of the addition. So you multiply it by the two action movies. There are only two action movies that you were given. So two times one. And then you multiply it by three of the drama movie. So three times two times one, which gives you 1,440 ways to watch your movie in specific order. So you can do comedy, action, drama, or drama, action, comedy, but you know, different movie with titles and so on. So 1,444 ways to pick. Let me put this on the next page. Any question? So for the next question, it says, if you decide to watch all the comedy movies first, then watch the action movie, how many distinct arrangements are possible? So we know that there are five comedies movies. We just saw in the notes that we would do five factorial. And then since we are doing the and, right, comedy and action, so we will multiply. And then two of the action movie, which is two factorial, which gives you 240 possible arrangements of movies you can watch for action and comedy.
assuming that we don't rewatch the movie, right? We just watch it once and move on. Any question? And that's all she wrote for today. Not bad, huh? Nothing too crazy. Good. All right. I'm glad that, that you're able to understand that fine. Any questions before we end the session? Okay, if you are finished, type your name in the chat for attendance log. I'm gonna stop recording.